Hi everyone, we're going to get started here. Thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. It's been a, a trying week for the entire city, so we appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, my name is Kate Barbera. I'm the Assistant Archivist for the University Libraries. And I am thrilled to introduce to you our speakers today. This is our very first installment of the Library <laughs> Speaker series. Um, and we have today Ingrid Schaffner and Elizabeth Tufts Brown. They join us from Carnegie Museum of Art, where I had the privilege of working as an archivist on their time based media project for about two years. I worked with Elizabeth and many others at the museum to uncover, investigate, and preserve the history of their remarkable film and video department. I also had the privilege of working with the Carnegie International Archives. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Carnegie International has been a staple in our city since 1896. Yes, you heard that correctly, 1896 which makes it one of the longest running um, biennial exhibitions in the entire world. The exhibition has a long history of bringing innovative artists, talent, thinkers to our city, and I am excited that Ingrid and Elizabeth are going to share some of that history with you today and also highlight some materials from the Carnegie International Archive. Um, Ingrid Schaffner is an American curator, art critic, writer, and educator specializing in contemporary art. She is currently at work on the Carnegie International 57th edition 2018, which will be on view through March 25th, 2019. From 2000 to 2015, Ingrid directed the exhibition program at the Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Pennsylvania, one of the leading museums dedicated to exhibiting the innovative art of our time. Her many significant monographic and thematic exhibitions have brought attention to under-recognized under artists and little explored themes and practices in the art world. Elizabeth Tufts Brown is Associate Registrar for the Permanent Collection and the Archives at Carnegie Museum of Art. She has a bachelor's degree in art history from the College of William and Mary and a master's degree in art history from George Washington University. Elizabeth has worked with the CMOA Archives for over 20 years and has a special interest in the history of the International. I want to thank Ingrid and Elizabeth for being with us here today. We're very excited that they've agreed to join us to kick off our library speaker series. Um, after the talk, I welcome all of you to join us in the lobby right outside for lunch. Um, I also encourage you to check out uh, the Frankenstein Complex, which is the exhibition on display here in Posner. Um, so without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Ingrid Schaffner and Elizabeth Tufts Brown. Okay. Take away, Elizabeth. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Tufts Brown. I'm associate registrar for collections and archives at Carnegie Museum of Art. The just to explain what I do at the museum, the collections part of my job. Uh, I bring in all the new gifts and purchases four times a year for the collection. And then the archives part, um, registrars are the record keepers of the museum, so we sort of naturally took charge of keeping the archives. Um, somehow it started falling to me to answer all the public inquiries that came in that required research in the archives. We get about 300 inquiries a year. They used to come in by phone call or letter. Now they come in by email or from our website, also by phone call. Um, and about, I'd say once a week, I would get something, a question about something like this, which is hard to see, but it is the label off the back of a painting. And people would say, I found a painting, I have a painting, I bought a painting, I'm looking to buy a painting that has this label on the back. And it says Carnegie Institute or 
Some of the later ones actually say Carnegie International and the year. Um, so I would take that information, that little information, and try and find out what international was it in? Do I have an image of it? Is it in the catalog? The complicating thing is that a lot of these paintings were not in the actual exhibition. They were submitted and then rejected. So they have the tag and people think that means it was in the show, but not always. So that's kind of how I got pulled into the archives. So just a little bit of background. I know you all know this face very well. Andrew Carnegie was our founder as well as yours. In 1895, he built his Palace of Culture, which included the Carnegie Museum, and that eventually split off into the Museum of Natural History and the Museum of Art, the Carnegie Library, and the Carnegie Music Hall. Um, at the same time, he stipulated there should be an annual exhibition of art, and he wanted to build a collection of the old masters of tomorrow. So his idea was to, to buy something out of each international. So in 1895, our first building on the left was built. It really was in the middle of nowhere. There wasn't much in Oakland at that time. I think that that ditch there is now Shenley Plaza because uh, that's the library side of the building. Those two towers, Andrew Carnegie hated and called them donkey ears. Um, so as you can see in the next enlargement of the building, those are gone. Actually, the base of them is still inside the building. Um, so in, by 1907, we had to enlarge because he had been uh, collecting dinosaur bones, which needed a large space to be exhibited in. And also, we added our Hall of Architecture with the plaster casts of buildings from around the world. So the early internationals, which... Um, actually started in 1896, I have a typo there, uh, and until 1922, John Beatty was the director of the Department of Fine Arts, which was within the museum, and he was also the curator of the show. He would travel around for about three months out of the year and visit studios and decide what was going to be in the international, and then every year he was doing that, so a quarter of his life he was traveling, selecting art. Um, and it would arrive like this, on wagons. I suppose it came by boat from Europe and then by train from New York and then wagons like this from either downtown or East Liberty, wherever they were coming in. Um, the exhibition was suspended a couple of times. In 1906 we were busy building that big enlargement of our building, so they did not have an international. And then, of course, due to World War I, in 19, from 1915 to 19, there was no international. Jump forward to 1974, and we enlarged again and added that section at the upper left, which is the SCAFE galleries. And um, it was a good thing because by that point, um, we were still collecting contem contemporary art out of the internationals, and contemporary art was getting bigger and bigger. Uh, I'm going to fast forward okay, to, all right. to today. All right, so bigger and bigger. <laughs> I, uh, bigger, bigger and bigger and, bi and building scale. So he, um, here is um, work by El Anatsui on the facade of the Carnegie Museum right now, signaling that the Carnegie International is in the house. Um, El is a Ghanaian artist who um, is based in Nsuka, Nigeria, and it's a beautiful bridging of Ghana, Nsuka, Pittsburgh, Oakland, and Wilkinsburg, because much of the piece was fabricated here in Pittsburgh um, D. Briggs, a sculptor in Wilkinsburg, whose uh, studio is a firehouse, and she makes big sculpture. When I was looking for someone to help put this thing together, um, which came in bits and pieces from Nigeria, 
um, Dee with her um, community, it was a summer job for lots of kids this, this summer, was uh, to make this incredible work of art that's on the facade of the building. And let me just say, um, uh, the Richard Serra sculpture that's on the plaza was um, part of the 1985 Carnegie International. And um, L responded to it with his work um, called Three Angles. Um, you can see the, um, the part of the composition um, has a similar kind of wedge-shaped form. And whereas Richard Serra's sculpture is made out of tons and tons of court and steel, um, that dark part of Elle's sculpture is thousands and thousands of bottle caps that are all um, joined together by pieces of copper wire. And then um, uh, the, 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 the rest of the sculpture, there's a kind of mirrored material behind the Richard Serra that Elle wanted to bring the sky in and open up space for the Serra to kind of let it lift off from the building which he feels kind of obscures it. And then El said that he wanted to kind of fill in the rest with something that's very quotidian every day and what could be more every day than information. So the, um, there's plates that were donated by the Nepper Printing Press here in Pittsburgh, aluminum printing plates to make this um, sculpture, which also kind of reads as a painting. And for El, these um, diagonal lines across the surface for him are a conjuring of the um, the confluence of the rivers that we are at here in Pittsburgh. So it's, um, it's very sighted and it's very much um, a bridge to the international. And then you've also probably noticed on the exterior of the old building, <laughs> um, the neons. And the, I'm sorry, this is not the best image, but that's what I got. So these um, uh, encircling the um, the uh, the old building and around the facade of the Carnegie Library are names. It's a work of art by uh, Tavares Strawn, a Bahamian artist who when he visited the museum was very interested in the names engraved on the building, the names of great white men. So Tavares has added a contemporary, um, a contemporary list of women and people of color who have also contributed to art, science, literature, um, exploration, engineering. And these names are, um, you can find them if you could open it, but you can't, um, in this uh, book that's um, on view in the International. It is the Encyclopedia of the Invisible that Tavares researched and created. And it is massive. And when you do open it and look inside, it looks like every Collier's or Encyclopedia Britannica that you ever copied a research paper from in grammar school, except all of the entries are of people you don't know. So um, Tavares's bigger project is to um, um, uh, illuminate a history of the invisible. And so um, I like the way he's transformed our whole building into um, something, yeah, something encyclopedic. All right, so yes, it's the 57th Carnegie International. Mm. And here is my team. Uh, on the left, Ashley McNellis, curatorial assistant, and Liz Park, associate curator. And to say that um, when you do the Carnegie International, um, it's a gig. I came here in um, summer of 2015 to um, uh, research the exhibition put the exhibition together, make the publications, um, and then when the exhibition is over, me and my team, a, a horse, maybe that wagon shows up and we get on it and we yeah, 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 head, yeah, head on out of town. So, um, and this has been the tradition since 1991. So I think of there's an old history of the international and then there's a contemporary history of the international. It begins in 91 when outside curators are brought in to do this signature exhibition of the museum. And um, I was thinking a lot, I've been um, coming to Pittsburgh since 95 to see the International. It really is a magnet for the field, um, a real be bellwether for the field. So, um, and so I've been thinking about this exhibition building on those past internationals. And I thought a lot about this space, the um, Hall of Sculpture and how it becomes a kind of the icon of your international, so the icon of my international is not this. So, um, so just to show you, um, here's from 1991, a work by Alan McCullum, who it's um, thinking about the museum and its collections. 
um, it's casts of dinosaur bones from our own great paleontology collection. So um, casts of dinosaur bones, it's like making the, the, yeah, the museum as boneyard. Um, and there's a wonderful little anecdote of a, uh, a child looking at this with his father and the father saying, well, I don't think they've put this one back together yet, son. <laughs> so yes, contemporary art, so flummoxing. So, um, and then here's uh, just, Quickly, so you have in your mind too, here's from 1995, and here's from 1999, and here's from 2004. And it, it doesn't matter who, but just so you can see how this is a, bit, a very dynamic frame. This is 2008, and then here's from the last international. And I'm sorry, I, I don't have an image of what's in it. You almost have to go and see. It's an amazing work by Post Commodity, um, an indigenous collective who um, created what for them is a sort of a sand painting made out of chunks of glass, uh, coal, and steel. So it is a made of the materiality of Pittsburgh's own industries. So, and you'll all see it. And to Elizabeth's point about how important the International is for building the museum's collections, this is our Winslow Homer that has the accession number of one. So Homer won the Carnegie Prize in 1996. We acquired this picture, and um, uh, and we will and we will acquire works from this current International just as we did the last International. So oops, and I thought I had an image here. Uh, there's been a, a poltergeist in my slides. Uh oh. Mm. Uh, well. <laughs> Did I do it? So anyways, yes, yes, yes. All right, I'm going to go right. back to this okay. just for a minute mm -hmm. because um, Winslow Homer actually didn't win the first prize. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. I he, he won the chronological medal, which was Andrew Carnegie's idea to buy one painting from each year of the International, so it had to be painted in that year. It was supposed to be not ever exhibited before. It was an American artist. It was like very uh, constricted. So that only actually lasted a couple of years <laughs> because I think it was in 1897, they couldn't find a painting they wanted for 1897, so then they didn't buy one. But the next year there was a painting that was painted in 1897 that they got instead. So that kind of fell apart. We do buy out of each international. And I will say that um, there are two prizes now given for the international, mm -hmm. the Carnegie Prize and the Fine Prize, and Post Commodity, whose work is in the Hall of Sculpture, which I did not show you, they won the Fine Prize, so they were. The yes. prizes continue. Yes, the prizes do continue. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to give you a view of the archives, and that those gray boxes are Kate's property there, um, but uh, the top right, those are all the original entry blanks from uh, the artists that were in the internationals all the way back to 1896. So a lot of our early papers before 1941 are actually on deposit at the Archives of American Art. Uh, I think when they were building the SCAFE galleries, they decided, oh, what are we going to do with all these papers? So they gave them to the archives. And it's actually good because they digitized most of the, at least the international papers, so people can do research on them. But we still have the, the entry blanks. And I have a couple up here on the table for you to look at um, afterwards. We also have correspondence, we have photographs, we have all the catalogs, um, and we have shipping records. So we have a lot of materials even without this, the things that are now in Washington. And that leads to Ingrid again. So, um, uh, in embarking on the international, the world is, a, your, is your onion, and, and of course, you're not going to travel the entire world. So, um, I was um, interested in this idea of thinking about my travel building on the travel since 1991 and the idea that on the Contemporary International has been kind of um, mapping a global contemporary art world. So, um, uh, what, a great, what a great project for some interns to research 
the past international curators' travels because no, there weren't just like handy itineraries lying about. So um, uh, three interns uh, worked on this project to go through the files and reconstruct the itineraries of curators from 90, 1991 to 2013, and then we added my lick of travel too. So you can see it better on the screen in front of you, the sort of color. Um, each color is a different curator's year of travel and um, how we're, we're mapping the world here. And um, it's nice, um, the uh, researchers wrote a piece published on our online magazine about their methodology and research. Um, and it was like really going into the files and finding... It was. They were, they were looking at receipts from like restaurants just to say, oh yes, they were there on this day. Yeah, so... Uh, and travel agent, uh, you know, itineraries and all sorts of things. Whatever. Whatever yeah. we could find. Whatever we could find. So um, the map, I think, is called something like a fantastical map because it's, um, uh, there's a lot of, um, the uh, confidence gaps. factor isn't always 10 for every one of the, uh, right. the itineraries. So what's next here? Ooh. The little are black you starting books. Go, mm. about you. Me? You should okay. tell with the army. Okay, so the little black books, um, when I was always doing research about the early internationals, I would, I would see mentions of the little black books, the little black books, prepare the little back, black books for Homer St. Gaudens' trip this summer. And I was like, where are these little black books? And I asked the Archives of American Art, have you ever seen these little black books? No, no, no trace of them, no trace of them at the museum, no trace in Washington. Well, one day, Ingrid gets a phone call so, um, and I should say, because I'm a real archive geek, Elizabeth was one of the first colleagues I um, met with when I started mm -hmm. working on the International to learn about the, the, the history and its holdings, and that's where I learned about the, the mystery of the little black book. So one day I came to work, and the phone rings bright and early. It's a phone call from Paris. Um, hello, I actually didn't have front tax, but I can't do that. So I said, hello, my name is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, my name is Francis Washburn, Francis, yes. um, and my father used to be the director at your art museum, and um, I live in a tiny little apartment in Paris, and I'm trying to get rid of some things, and I have these little black books. <laughs> and, and I mean, she literally said these little black yeah. books. I'm like, hold the line. So I go running down the hall, and I get Elizabeth, and, and then we're like this, and um, she says, that we're welcome to have them. She said, I'm sure you have copies, but I just thought I'd check. She said, they're in my fireplace in my apartment. <laughs> I really need to get them out of there. So she asked if we would like them. We happened to have one of our curators going to Paris the following week on a, a trip, and she said she would pick them up for us. <laughs> and so now we have them, and they're um, organized by country. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, they're they're little three ring binders, or, you know, six ring six binders, rings. <laughs> like a like a Philofax, if anybody still knows what that is. Yeah, and um, information um, uh, typed about when you're in Paris, what hotel, what the restaurants are, lists of studio uh, artists and addresses, and then they're annotated right. by the. And they were prepared yearly for the director. Right, so lots of times they say uh, for a certain artist what they had in the last two or three internationals, just as a reminder, and then maybe if they have an idea of what they might be able to show the director this mm -hmm. time. And with little annotations by the director then in pencil that would say, no. <laughs> or, or say the red one, or you know, like or these little mnemonic yeah, devices. Some, sometimes yeah. they're little sketches of what uh -huh. they saw. It's really fascinating. Yeah. So, um, uh, the little black books, I guess. That's that's a picture of Gordon Bailey Washburn um, with Mr. Bovard, I think, who was the president of the institute, and they're, you know, planning the 1958 international biggest ever. And we're going to talk a bit about how the black books were um, 
the kind of methodology? I think of... that's the next one. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh. so, yeah. Um, Gordon Washburn took over that uh, black book from Homer St. Gaudens, so I have never found Homer St. Gaudens' black books, but we have the, the uh, descendants of them. Mm -hmm. But I know he used the, the same thing because I've seen those mentions of, of the black books in the correspondence. So uh, we have a whole series of these photographs of him visiting the artist's studios, mostly in the like 20s and 30s, I guess, so before World War II. Um, on the left, he's there with Reginald Marsh and I guess his wife, and they're sitting down to some kind of meal. Um, he, I think, was great friends with a lot of these artists. Um, on the right, that's Mondrian in his studio. It's not a very good photo, but I knew you'd all know who that was. Um, yeah, so he, uh, just like, like uh, Beatty and I'm sure Washburn, they all traveled for significant parts of their years. And here I have um, Homer St. Gaudens, of course, was traveling across the Atlantic on a boat. And there's part of his itinerary for, I think it's 1922 or 23 or 24. And at the bottom, it's like 10 days on the steamer to get home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just like one after the other city. So pretty intense, but then Ingrid has her travel story yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, and so it continues. Got to get out there, do your research. So, um, uh, faced with this question of how am I going to um, strategically organize my research, I'm not going to go everywhere in the world, um, I really wanted to get off of my own beaten path as a curator who travels to Europe routinely and to different parts of the United States and major cities in South America. So, um, uh, so I hatched this idea of inviting five curator colleagues in different parts of the field to each go on a trip with me someplace new to both of us. So to travel for two weeks with a colleague as a thinking and traveling partner, the, the companions, as I called them, weren't my co-curators by any stretch. They were really, um, uh, yeah, colleagues to be with in the field. And that, um, that the travel would be following their own interests, their own trajectories of research. It really did get us both off of our own beaten paths. And I like this idea, too, of the international supporting research, like in kind of that great tradition of the Natural History Museum, sending scientists out into the field. So here they were sending uh, me and my curatorial companions out into the field. And um, just uh, briefly, um, Karen Coney, I traveled in parts of West Africa. She's the curator, the director of the Vera List Center of Art and Politics at the New School. Rupa Katrib and I, Rupa was interested in going to some place mid, uh, very specific, Recently, recently Soviet or newly post-Soviet and uh, near Middle East. So we went to the Caucasus region. Um, uh, Ruba's at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Dorian Chong um, is a curator at the um, Museum of Modern Art in Hong Kong. And we were headed to Pakistan and Bangladesh and then there were terrorist attacks um, directed at um, Americans, Europeans. It didn't seem like a good place for me to go, so we went to India instead. BC Silva, um, a curator based in Lagos, Nigeria, has um, her research is Art of the African Diaspora. We traveled in the Caribbean. And then Magli Ariola is a curator based in Mexico City. And she was interested in this sort of um, tra trade routes, cultural routes, um, history of colonization um, that would connect Mexico City and Manila. So both under Spanish rule in, um, in colonial histories. So we traveled in parts of Southeast Asia. And um, we too had intense itineraries that were composed by Liz Park, my associate curator, taking um, sort of leads from me and leads from my companion. And then um, the criteria for her, our, for our travel, was not for me to run around and find artists to bring to Pittsburgh, which is a very colonial model, um, not a contemporary one but to really have a bigger understanding of what is the contemporary when you move outside of the hubs of this art world. So um, that was our research quest. And I just wanted to show you a picture of my office. 
Here was my, uh, this is the map, this is Buckminster Fuller's uh, 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 map of the world that um, shows the true relationships of uh, scales of continents. It has no right side up or upside down. So that was our, that was my field of research. And then just an anecdote from the travel with BC Silva. Um, we were in Haiti and we were visiting the Centre d'Art and um, they were preparing for their first exhibition since um, the earthquake had really um, devastated their facility, uh, an exhibition of a Haitian artist named uh, Jasmine Joseph. Um, here's one of his paintings from the 1950s. And um, uh, we had a lovely visit, and when I came back, uh, their archivist reached out to me, and she said, well, we were going through our archives here, and we found this letter from your museum. Um, uh, in 1957, inviting Jasmine Joseph to participate in the Carnegie International. And we wondered, did he participate in the Carnegie International? And there it is, it's signed by the, Gordon, uh, Washburn. Gordon Washburn. Okay. So um, it's probably a little black book that relates to all this. We should look. Oh, we should look. <laughs> but, but we did look in the catalog, and indeed, uh, Jasmine Joseph did participate in the Carnegie International. So I love this, that even in the even in the contemporary travel and research, you're coming upon the history mm -hmm. of this exhibition. So um, uh, a number of artists have engaged with the history of the show, with Pittsburgh, um, but specifically um, with the archives, the artists uh, John Rubin and Lenka Clayton, both of whom are based here in Pittsburgh, have national, international careers as artists. John, of course, is the head of graduate studies in the fine arts department here at CMU. So I asked them to um, create a project that would activate uh, uh, one of the galleries, um, the main galleries when you first walk in off the lobby. And um, so John and Lenka, in their way, um, spent a lot of time in the museum, spent a lot of time with Elizabeth, kind of being directed to different archives, um, file, parts of the history that they might. Yeah, we looked at a lot of different things. Yeah. Yeah, including the little records, black books. Including the little black books. That was the start. That was the start. But um, what they ended up being drawn to, maybe you want to say what this... Um, so this is uh, what we call the Carnegie International Record Card, and each artist has one or more. This is Gary Melchers, who sh uh, exhibited in a lot of internationals. This is card two for Melchers. Um, so it has the name of the artist, their nationality, of course, when they died. Um, and then each year that they participated on the left and the name of the painting, AE at the left is annual exhibition, so is it the first, the second, these are later, the 11th. Um, on the right it says whether it was listed like in the catalog, I believe, and it looks like Melchers was on the jury a lot of these years, so he was not um, qualified to get a prize. So they noted that, but A and R is accepted or rejected. Looks like most of these were accepted. Position refers to how they hung, because uh, the salon hanging that in the early 20th century where they would have like paintings stacked on top of each other on the wall. So one was the coveted position, the bottom. It's like Melchers did well. Um, so John and Lenka looked at these cards and they were fascinated by the rejected titles which were noted by an R. Melchers, of course, doesn't have any. But, and then they were also looking at the actual titles. Um, we kept track of the rejected titles up to 1931. Yeah, the, um, Carnegie was a painting annual up until 31. Yes. Yeah. And artists submitted their work for uh, consideration. So, um, John and Lenka were drawn to all of the R's, which um, just imagine some of those A's are R's. And um, they, uh, this is their project for the international, and there, there are Lenka and John. But um, at, when the museum's open, you will see two painters at this uh, table in the gallery, and they are um, translating the R title, rejected titles, into new paintings, these text paintings that um, then get hung on the wall, and then it's like a clock um, uh, that as new paintings are added, they all, they shift, and um, eventually 
uh, make their way to this bin because uh, there's only so many slots and there. It's like a like a Fordist project. They're churning out these titles, and um, when they reach the bin, they are there for takes. So uh, visitors can take home a rejected title, new painting from the Carnegie International, and they have. It's been it's been really it's wonderful to walk around the museum and you see people with these. They're kind of large too. These um, paintings under their arms apparently. Um, opening weekend, um, visitors from afar who were at the airport could identify one another because they're walking around with these um, rejected titles under their and under actually, their arms. They, they don't usually make their way to the bin because people are waiting for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a it's a wonderful project. It really is activating this international and the history of the Carnegie International by way of the archive. So. Um, to say um, I am an archive geek, I did an exhibition, uh, an important exhibition for me and my work that looked at um, archiving and collecting as, um, as process for contemporary artists, as imagery for contemporary artists. So I am always thinking about the archives. So even um, beginning on this project, yes, Elizabeth was one of the first um, colleagues I wanted to meet, and thinking about how this international, um, it, it is exhibition, but it will then be archived. So one of the first um, uh, things we did, uh, the team did, is we, um, we got our website up and running um, on, uh, our, this is our website homepage. You can see it's very lean, um, that's purposeful. Um, and um, you, could, you could click on participants. There was, we didn't have a database at the museum where you could put in an artist's name and see who was in the international. So one of the things that we did was to create just that. So now you can um, type in a name. You could type in Whistler and um, do search. And you could see that Whistler was in many, 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 many Carnegie Internationals as an artist, as a juror, et cetera. <laughs> so um, our international will enter this database that we created. And um, uh, this is super geeky, but um, uh, the, the International has sort of three design phases for me. So that first phase, like the website that it was so lean, um, was the <clears throat> truss phase, like named for a truss bridge, which is just the most like simple industrial kind of bridge. And in that phase of the exhibition and the kind of uh, research and development phase, we referred to the International as Carnegie Intel 57th Ed 2018. And it had this kind of almost typewriter font. So now we're in the fuss phase with the exhibition on, and now it's the Carnegie International 57th edition 2018 with this kind of um, fussy, fa um, fussy font. And so our, 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 our exhibition guide, um, that's, the, that's the identity right now for the international. But we will be entering soon <laughs> the catenary phase. So um, a catenary is a natural line between two points, so like a, a, like a rope bridge is a catenary. And so obviously I was thinking about Pittsburgh and its bridges, and as we make to cat our way to catenary, I think of like the whole project kind of snapping down, and we just turn into CI 57 2018. And that's as we enter archive. So um, we're doing a second publication for the uh, international, and it will be in this... Um, Sort of, yeah, lean, mean, catenary scheme. And, um, yeah, and we're going to work with Elizabeth to put all our papers. We're already doing it. We're already doing it. Mm -hmm. And no other inter curators ever done that, have they, Elizabeth? No, you've been uh -huh. great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Usually they just leave you with boxes of. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, as you know. Yeah, so, anyway, so, okay. So, um, just to end uh, the presentation with, I'm going to be speaking next Thursday um, about the International at the museum, uh, 6.30 to 8. I won't talk all that time, but I'll talk for quite a bit of it. Um, and it's this kind of fast-moving look at the, at, the, at the show, which I've been giving annually. So I hope that you'll come to that um, to hear more about the Carnegie International. And I think... Um, now, how would you I like think, to proceed? I think um, Kate's going to take some questions for us, but I just wanted to mention I brought in lots of show and tell up in the front. Um, please be careful with the, the materials that you can tell are old and delicate, but um, you can touch anything. And 
there's catalogs, there's a scrapbook, there are, are some documents and photographs. I'm just going to point out, this is the catalog for the first Carnegie International, and this is the guide for the current Carnegie International. So we were yeah, thinking about histories. And another thing that Elizabeth brought that you really have to see is Edvard Munch. Here's Edvard Munch's, um, he's, uh, his, uh, his, what is this? Is this this is his entry blank, so, and it is signed by him. So it tells the, the name of the painting that he wanted to submit to the International and how much it was valued at and the value of the frame and where they should pick it up. And then they signed it. Yeah, and actually this is the other real treasure. Um, this is a letter from Alexander Calder. And he's, I don't know if you can see, there's a little sketch up here of his mobile, which is now at the airport. But it was designed for the Grand Staircase uh, at the Carnegie and hung there for many years. It was part of the Carnegie International back in It was, the 58 International. All right. All right, so we're going to open it up for questions now. Um, yeah, Brian. All right, my name is Brian Splenda. Um, thank you for presenting today. A quick question. Is that uh, the database a public facing and free database? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The archives no, no, it's um, so um, we created our own website just for the international. I think it's Carnegie it's International, international 2018. Artists. And so that's where you can learn about programs and there's readings and, and that's where this little okay. toy <laughs> exists, yeah. So yeah, at the museum we have, of course, our own internal database, but mostly we focus on paintings that we have in our collection that were also in the international. Um, we do have other, you know, if you ever have a question, call me. It's natural for a library to ask about a database. But Absolutely. Well, also, that then our database, um, thinking about how our website will probably vanish, um, well, we, all, we so also all the all the records went into the main database. Right, yeah. right, and we also have we do have an archives website, which is records.cmia.org. Kate set that up. Um, there's not much about the international international on it yet, but it will be eventually. Okay, thank you. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, way in the back. Thank you, that's my favorite question. I, I, I think um, we all should be asking that question. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's such a beautiful project. Um, as soon as Tabara showed me his first sketch of what it would look like, it was like, I almost couldn't believe that they weren't there because it's just so simple and, and yet you can't even imagine how hard it was to get those names up there where there's no electricity and it's a historic building, you can't drill a hole in it and, uh, and on and on and on. But um, there they are and right now the, there is no plan for them to stay but I think I'll, I'll, I'll miss them when they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. What can we do to advocate to keep them because the night that it opened I didn't know those were there. I'd been kind of out to lunch doing whatever, you know, just not even thinking about it. And I got out of my car. I didn't do the, you know, the valley party. So I was just like down the street and I walked up and it's dark and these lights are there. And I think after living in Pittsburgh for almost a decade, I, I hadn't even made it in the door and I was almost weeping coming Aww. up to the museum because I thought this is the first time we're there. You know, it had always been every time I walked up a list of white men and it was the first time I felt like we're, we're well, um, while you were weeping, then yes. there's a lot of people <laughs> weeping because um, Tavares had this performance that he, for him, was a happening. So it was this kind of a, uh, a little pop-up performance yeah. where um, children um, uh, wearing these little bomber jackets that Tavares' mother had made the Bahamas for them. Um, this is performance where they. Um, uh, they um, own the names of different, so like this little girl jumps on, there's a little soapbox and this little girl jumps on and she says, I'm Shirley Chisholm. And then she like says, so like about 10 kids perform different names. There's a lot of weeping going on that night. Yeah. But I, I, I mean, I don't know what, uh, I don't have an answer yet, but 
the more I hear the question, the more there needs to be an answer. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it's and um, it was really done in partnership with the library. You had to welcome the piece, and they and, um, they did, and so. Vested interest, perhaps on both sides. I feel like it yeah. fixed something that had always been missing. So, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah. Hi. Um, can you talk a little bit about why there are no text panels within the museum and why they're all contained in the garden? Um. Uh. So there's there's one didactic panel when you first walk in, and um, I call it the billboard because it's big and it's um, welcoming and um, kind of lays out the, um, some of the, the big ideas for the show. But I really wanted to make an exhibition where uh, we as uh, visitors didn't walk into a gallery and look for words to read. And I selected artists who, whose work I knew would be very present in the galleries and um, and worked closely with the artists to really think about them inhabiting the space with their work. And um, I think the show is very successful in that, that I, um, people do seem to feel really just free to be in the exhibition. And, but yet, um, uh, I've written a text on wall text, so I think a lot about wall text and how you use it strategically <laughs> or not. And um, so we want that information available, and so that's, I, I, I love 19th century travel guides, so I love the idea that you would have a little guide. And the, there are wall labels that will say the artist's name and the title, and then it has a page reference, and you could turn to page 94 and read a little bit about Rachel Rose in the gallery or later. And the guide is it's accessible in that it's, I mean, it's a $15 purchase, or you can loan them for free and just wander with one in the gallery. And um, because I didn't, I, wa I wanted to show where you, with the art in the museum. Thank you for that question. <laughs> yeah. The black folks that went to Paris, were they supposed to leave the museum? Probably not. <laughs> that sounds like an archivist question. Um, yeah, I'm going to say no. <laughs> we kind of consider them as, you know, they were working documents. So we're just happy to have them back. Actually, we when we got the collection of, of black books, there were some that Gordon Washburn had used after he left the museum. He went to New York after Pittsburgh. And so he went to Asia, Asia House, Asia Society in New York. And so I've actually sent those notebooks on to them. Yeah. So this is a difficult question. Um, do you have any favorites? I mean, that's like asking which kid do you <laughs> like the best? Um, that, that, that is a kind of impossible question because I really invested a lot in each artist and their work um, in, in the the invitation to the artists was to participate in making the show together. And so artists did come here and they spent time. And um, I think that's another part of the why the, the show is so situated, because artists really did think about the spaces and the history and the context. So it's hard for me to uh, uh, pick a favorite. I do very much enjoy the installation that is in the decorative um, arts collection by an artist, Karen Klimnik, a Philadelphia uh, artist who she makes paintings, sculptures, photography, video, um, and always um, kind of thinking about her work in terms of um, a kind of theater of art. And so Karen's an artist that I've worked with a lot in the past, and I'll continue to work with her in the future, and I loved how she cited her installations, which feel like, they feel like 19th century salon style installations, very, she loves the decorative and she loves the ballet, but then it's, a, it's totally punk when you start reading the titles for, for the works, like there's this little charming photograph of some sheep, and, um, uh, and it, I, I made this little, it feels like a, yeah, a little 19th century gallery brochure, and you find a number, and 
You see, it's um, the pretty peeing sheep. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought first it was meant to be the peering sheep, but no, it is the peeing sheep. And then it's like, every, it's the whole thing is just filled with delight and subversion that I love. Yeah, and I can just add my own experience. I've worked on eight internationals. And um, it's really hard to divorce your view of the work from your experience with the artist. Mm -hmm. Because um, I worked on a lot of installations, and some artists are very difficult to work with, and that makes me not like their work quite as much. Um, but yeah, it's hard to pick a favorite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I always say it's hard to be an artist and get your vision out in the world. So yeah, I, I got my. We've got some difficult ones. <laughs> Any additional questions? Yeah. Uh, I wonder, uh, you're looking at the title of this lecture and your, and your research question, what is the contemporary outside of the hubs? Mm -hmm. Could you give us some high points of what uh, the answer to that question is? Ah, spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, it's like a contradiction in terms, contemporary and history, because contemporary can't have history where in it it's moving um, it's in formation uh, as we're standing in it. But I say so is history, and that's the, the, our job is to be kind of always retelling and uh, re narrating history and histories. And um, so I've been giving the same lecture for, for over 10 years, um, but it's not the same lecture, of course, because every time it's different. But it has a structure in terms of these very open themes. And um, uh, as I've been giving it here, the first time I gave it, it was to look at the past internationals and think about how they defined a contemporary. And the next time was about my research in the field and the kind of contemporary I was finding. So this time it's actually going to be how our exhibition might help us think about the contemporary and its conditions. Which are ever changing. Any other questions? Yeah. Where you talked about the three phases, um, the truss bridge, the bus phase, uh, catenary. Catenary. Mm -hmm. um, are there? Are did you? Were the artists that were represented in the international? Were there? Are they showing in those three phases? No, that was just kind of a structural thing for um, how I was thinking about the exhibition um, unfolding. I, I need a lot of structure. I mean, you can kind of get the. How is it going to do the travel? I was it, I needed like this kind of five companions and um, uh, the this trust plus catenary. Um, I feel silly saying it, but it was um, I had um, a, a, also a creative team. I did introduce you to, and they were consultants who um, kind of like the people you would begin. You would bring it in at the end of your project at, uh, when you're making an exhibition to make your catalog with you. So designer and editors. I invited those people from the beginning. And um, they're colleagues who I've worked with in the past in different ways. And they are um, as much thinking about exhibition and exhibition making and great as it's sort of craft and detail as I do. And so um, these I, that, there, that there were these sort of editorial and design through lines for the whole thing that make it very holistic. And I think that's another thing you feel in the show, the way the, um, the, we took over the signage of the whole museum and it's kind of unified in a way that um, is connected to the exhibition and it's all one experience in the museum. And that kind of came out of sort of thinking through these structures for three years. Three years. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have time for one final question. So I know the catalog is going to come out in March. Hopefully um, the end of February. <laughs> so does that have process shots? Because I know there are no images of the work in its finished state that are there right now. So did you take process shots of how the artist was making the work in the space? Um, or is that not? 
You know, um, so uh, um, you have this conundrum when you're um, uh, making an exhibition and you're making a catalog, and if you're making a contemporary exhibition that doesn't even exist until the day the thing opens and the artist is done, you know. <laughs> um, so that's why there's no pictures in the guide. I didn't want to have pictures of artists, you know, representative works, because those aren't the works of the Carnegie International. So the second publication, called the Dispatch, um, has installation views, but not process views. But um, on our uh, being published on the museum's website are these films that um, uh, Tom Fisher, our videographer, made incredible. Um, process videos of artists work and um, he's going to be it's like a series that he's going to be releasing over the course of the international that really sort of conversations with artists and then this process photography so that's accessible online yeah i want to thank all of you for being here today i encourage you to come up and look at the materials from the carnegie international archive um, they are powerful, and it's a really great way to connect with the history of this wonderful exhibition. Come up and check out the entry forms. They really are just remarkable, really, really remarkable. Um, I also welcome you to join us after at Words for lunch in the lobby and to check out the Frankenstein exhibit. So thank you so much, Ingrid and Elizabeth.